So in this video, we're going to talk about slab waveguides. And uh, what do I mean when I say slab? Well, I, I literally mean just a slab. So uh, if you've ever seen like a slab of marble or a slab of material, it's uh, I just mean something like that. So it's a slab of some, let's say, refractive index N1. And we're going to say for now that it has perfect mirrors on the top and on the bottom. And uh, I've just drawn one small section of this, but this slab actually extends out to infinity. So let me draw uh, the entire section of it. So it's a three-dimensional object, and it extends out infinitely in that direction and infinitely in that direction. And you might say, uh, Jordan, I don't have a slab sitting around my lab. What am I? Why? Why is this slab waveguide useful? Uh, much less an infinite slab. And uh, d don't worry about that. The uh, the reason we're analyzing a slab is because this will allow us to work essentially just in two dimensions. And that's really nice because we sort of will get an intuition for what solutions look like in three dimensions when we have real waveguides like rectangular waveguides or fiber optic cables, which are just cylindrical waveguides. So the slab waveguide is sort of the first step along that path. And we're just going to worry about the cross section of this slab waveguide because it turns out this will tell us just about everything we want to know about how this thing behaves. So I'm going to redraw that here. Um, we've got the cross sec. Whoa, whoa, whoa! We've got the cross section of our slab. There we go, nice and straight. Uh, and we've got two perfect mirrors. So a perfect mirror on the top and a perfect mirror on the bottom. And then this middle, the center region is some refractive index. Let's say n1. And so what happens when I send in light of a particular uh, frequency or equivalently a particular wavelength? Well, the answer is that it depends on the angle at which I send it. So maybe I send a plane wave uh, in this direction. So I send it uh, attacking the slab like this. Then we know that it's going to, there's a perfect mirror up here. So it's going to bounce off this perfect mirror. It's going to go back down to the other side. It's going to bounce off the perfect mirror a second time, and it's going to continue to do this infinitely. So we remember this slab is infinite in this direction and infinite in this direction. And to emphasize that, let me actually draw this going off the page so that it, uh, it actually kind of looks infinite. So infinite in the, uh, infinite in the right the direction going to the right. And as you might be able to guess, this wave can interfere with itself. So these phase fronts here might interfere with the phase fronts from a second bounce over here. And let me draw this at a, at a more aggressive angle to make it more, more clear how this process happens. So let's draw this at a, at a more aggressive angle so it's easier to visualize. So Let's say that we've got uh, one, one wave, and it starts out like this, so bounces off of the first interface, and then bounces off the interface a second time. And we know it'll keep bouncing and keep going on forever down the waveguide. But what happens with these two rays in particular? Well, this ray, uh, which I'm going to draw in blue, so I'm going to go over this in blue, this has a set of phase fronts associated with it. I'm going to draw one coming out like this. So this is one phase front, uh, another phase front, and so on and so on. And they're just separated by a distance of uh, lambda naught over the refractive index. And this ray, the second one, which I'm going to draw in green, well actually that's not, not super high contrast, let's draw that in yellow. Um, this ray here also has a set of associated phase fronts. So maybe it's got one here, one here, and so on and so on. And so you might imagine that if these phase fronts, if this yellow phase front and this blue one are right on top of each other, then we can get constructive interference. So this is just adding, for example, a sine wave to a sine wave. Uh, whereas if the phase fronts are exactly one wavelength distance apart, so say the blue one and the yellow one are half a wavelength apart, then we're adding uh, a sine wave and a negative sine wave, and we cancel out the wave. So it's very important what the where exactly these two phase fronts meet each other, or how far apart they are. 
And so as a, as a thought experiment, we might imagine, well, what if these waves did constructively interfere? Then if they were ideal plane waves, we'd expect to get twice the original amplitude, and then they bounce a couple more times, and then we get four times the original amplitude, and then eight, and so on and so on. These, these waves continue interfering with each other, and the amplitude just blows up to infinity. Whereas if we have perfect destructive interference, the amplitude starts out maybe at one, and then immediately just dies, and then there's no more wave left propagating down the waveguide. And if we're in between, uh, we actually end up with some sort of oscillation. So it doesn't quite completely get destroyed, it doesn't quite uh, propagate, but it sort of is weak all throughout the waveguide. But compared to this infinitely growing, uh, this continually constructive interfering wave, uh, this is effectively zero. Now obviously we can't fit infinite plane waves inside this finite uh, waveguide that's finite in this direction. Let's call this distance d just for fun. So this is somewhat oversimplified, but in general we want to look for waves that constructively interfere with each other, because these ones are going to be the ones that are transmitted the most strongly down the waveguide. And after some appreciable distance, they'll be the only ones that we'll be able to observe. And so we want to figure out exactly how do we get this yellow phase front to overlap with this blue one. So let's, let's redraw that. Let's pretend that we can do that. How would we go about doing that? So let's say that they're perfectly overlapping with each other. How do we make that happen? And let's say we have a particular frequency or we know our wavelength. Um, what angle corresponds to this constructive interference? Well, if we're at the peak of the sine wave at this location, we want to be again at the peak of the same sine wave here. And the, the rays are traveling in this direction. So they're traveling down and bouncing and coming back up. And so we want this total distance, uh, so let's call this point A, this point B, and this point C. Uh, by the time we traverse this total distance, we want to go back to the maximum of a sine wave, or we want the total phase change to be a multiple of 2 pi, so 2 pi times some integer m. Well, we can write this total phase change just as the wave number inside this material times the total length it has to traverse. And so the length here is from A to B to C. Uh, or we could also write this as 2 pi times a refractive index divided by the wavelength in free space multiplied by our total length. And so what is the total length L? Well, it's, it's just this distance first from A to B. And so we've got a right triangle. And let's say that we know this distance D as well. So this length AB uh, is just our waveguide diameter d divided by a cosine of theta. Now if we want to find bc we've also got another right triangle here and this took me a good five minutes to of staring at the paper to figure out. That was after the second time I did it. Now if we want to find bc we've also got a right triangle right here which is formed in terms of ac or uh, ab and we've also, the angle instead of theta is theta plus theta, or two theta. And so we can write BC just as AB times cosine of two theta. And if you add these two up and use some clever trig identities, you'll get that uh, AB plus BC, the total length is just 2D times cosine of theta. Oh, and up here it looks like I was missing a multiplied by L. Uh, but so we can plug this into our condition for the phase, uh, that the phase difference between these two points has to be 2 pi, or some multiple of 2 pi. This is just equal to KL, or 2 pi times N1. Uh, we said the refractive index inside here was N1. I apologize, not N. Um, times 2D cosine theta divided by lambda naught. And so the 2 pi's cancel. So in the next video, we'll be getting more into what this shape of light looks like inside the waveguide and more into the details of what these modes are and why they're significant. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you did, please give it a like down below and subscribe to my channel. Uh, also, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post those down below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. And thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.